in, of the day concurrently with the Appropriations Coronavirus Response Bill No. 2, 2021-2022. If there are no objections, the Chair will allow that course to be followed. So the question is that the amendment be disagreed to, and I call the member for McKellar. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, Deputy Chair, I, I listen very carefully to the Shadow Treasurer, as I always do, uh, because he often has much to say of great interest and great insight. Um, I was, however, amazed to hear him talk about warts, waste, excessive debt, and to blame this government. Um, he says that we have nothing to show uh, for the trillion dollars in debt that um, we are projected to reach. Uh, well, there are some things that we need to keep in mind. The first is that at the end of this, Australia will have one of the lowest debt-to-GDP ratios of any OECD nation on record. The other thing to keep in mind is, is that the debt that was racked up in the pre prior to COVID-19, at the end of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government, mm -hmm. at no point did the Labor Party assist us in reducing that debt. In fact, we would put up budget measures to ensure that the budget got back into surplus as soon as possible. And the Labor Party would, in the Senate, with the independents, with the crossbench, um, not only reject those efforts, they would vote them down. In other words, for the Labor Party to come in here and now claim that they're worried about debt is, well, kind of interesting. Um, and for them to say that we didn't do anything about it, given that they actively assisted and were um, planning with the independents, with the crossbench, with the fake independents that we see all across Australia these days, um, I think belies the fact that they cry crocodile tears when it comes to debt and deficit. Because they, they were the ones that put all the programs in place that led to the debt that we had. Uh, we balanced the budget. Um, and then the coronavirus, a global pandemic, came to blow that um, surplus that we would have enjoyed in 2020 out of the water. And when the shadow treasurer says, well, well, what do we get for it? I mean, Deputy Speaker, you look around the world and what you see is that um, in health terms, Australia's outcomes are some of, in fact, the best in the world. We have the lowest number of deaths, the highest number of vaccinations. Um, in economic terms, we have the lowest level of unemployment and the highest level of growth and the lowest level of public debt, both nominally and um, uh, as a ratio of GDP. Um, our growth in debt is some of the lowest in the world. The only country that beats us um, is uh, uh, the Chinese Republic, who um, last year they said uh, in, in 2021 they had one death from COVID. So it may be, and I'm not suggesting that, that this is the case, but it may be that some of their data collection techniques may need updating because I don't think out of 1.4 billion people, um, it is probable that only one person died from COVID in China last year. So when the shadow treasurer says, we have all this debt and we have all this spending and it's waste and, and it's, uh, it's about rorts and waste, I say to him in return, um, well, what is your plan to reduce debt? What is your plan to reduce spending? Or are you, in fact, not interested in reducing spending and re in reducing debt, but rather increasing taxes? Because what we have got from this record level of support is the best health outcomes and the best economic outcomes in the world. Indeed, the shadow treasurer said the Morrison government, the Morrison Liberal government, should be judged its success or failure should be judged on employment figures. And at the end of this pandemic, as, as we approach the end of this pandemic, after a long two-year journey, we are in fact in a position where our unemployment numbers are lower than they were in the beginning. So not using my test, not using the test of the Treasurer, the Prime Minister, anyone on this side of the House using the test of the shadow treasurer himself, what we have got from this spending and from this debt is an unmitigated success. It is not only an unmitigated success by his standards, 
It's an unmitigated success by the standards of literally every other nation in the world. But we can't, the Labor Party can't be proud of this country. The Labor Party can't be proud of Australians. They always have to be dragging us down. They always have to be bemoaning and belittling our nation and its people. They can't actually ever once say to the Australian people, you know what, we might get a lot wrong, but we got this one right. You know what, we may not be a perfect nation and we may not be a perfect people, but our mission is a perfect one. And at the end of the day, we have actually produced economic and health outcomes at the end of this pandemic that are the envy of the world. They are literally the envy of every other single nation in the world except for those on the left. On the left, it is something our success is something to be hated and reviled because they can't stand it. They can't stand it when we do well because their whole world view is that this nation is a nation built on awful and horribleness and any success is therefore not allowed to occur. So, Deputy Speaker, when I look at these bills, I, I, all I see is actually the great success of this nation, and not just this government, not just this parliament, but parliaments throughout this country. Some have got it more right than others, but our federation during this process, during one of the most testing crises that I hope I ever face in public life, actually adapted, was resilient, and tens of thousands of Austra hundreds of thousands of Australians are alive today that would not have been if not for the leadership of both this government, this parliament and parliaments throughout the country. Let us not forget that when this pandemic first started, the, um, the United Kingdom um, College uh, that is uh, expertise in this area estimated that 280,000 Australians would die. Norman Swan variously claimed that over 100,000 Australians would die. They were out by, by order. Thank God they were wrong. They were wrong by more than 97.5 per cent, which, as the member for Fenner can tell you, is two standard deviations, and that's a pretty rare occurrence. So I'm glad that the experts were wrong on that over and over again. But that didn't just happen, Deputy Speaker. That happened because of decisions that were made here. The money wasn't wasted. The money was used wisely to protect lives and livelihoods. And now we move to the next standard, to the next stage of this pandemic. To quote Churchill, this may not be the end, but it is certainly the beginning of the end. So we now need to start thinking about how this nation can recover, can build better, can build on our success, can take advantage of those of how well we have managed this pandemic. Has it been perfect? No. But I tell you what, I wasn't Michelle Ananda Raja going on Q&A, the Labor candidate for Higgins, claiming that AstraZeneca would um, lead to the deaths of young Australians. I wasn't Michelle Ananda Raja agreeing with the Premier, with the Chief Medical or the Chief Health Officer of Queensland, who is now the Governor of Queensland, that 18-year-olds would die if they took AstraZeneca. I wasn't Michelle Ananda Raja or the Chief Health Officer in um, Queensland scaring Australians in not taking a vaccine that would save lives and get us back to our normal lives quicker. And I wasn't the political party that endorsed that person for a seat in parliament. I think it, say, it says a lot about the quality control on, that, on the other side, that they would allow someone who had made such outrageous comments to, rep, to carry their banner into an election. And while we are talking about openness and transparency, we have once again, Deputy Speaker, a second reading amendment. And let's, let's be clear what the Labor Party, what the left is doing with these. There's a website. It's a dishonourable website. It is a website full of misinformation. It is a website that claims that members on this side of the House have voted in favour of slavery. It is an outrageous, despicable website. 
It should be shut down. In any civilised society, it would be shut down. But fortunately, we live in a society where we don't cancel free speech, where we allow people to put up outrageous comments so that so that we can have a free and open discussion of thought and belief. But when an organisation does this, and it has not only the acquiescence but the encouragement of those opposite who continue to move these second reading amendments so that they can then claim on this dishonourable website that, they, that members on this side voted against something that they very much voted in favour of, it just leads you to wonder where our politics lies today. Are we, are we driven by policies? Are we driven by driving the best outcomes for the people of Australia? Or are we driven by the hordes on Twitter? Are we driven by the personal politics of destruction and abuse? Or, uh, or do we wish to um, deliver a politics that delivers a higher sense of policy, where debate matters? where ideas drive our decisions? Or do we prefer to pull stunts like second reading amendment speeches that lower us to the lowest common denominator, that only spread misinformation, that lead people to um, that, that allow people to be characterised as believing exactly the polar opposite of what they have in some cases stood for all their lives and argued against all their lives? Is that the sort of nation we want to live in? And I ask those opposite, who are clearly um, playing the game with them, is that the kind of politics that they believe that this nation deserves? Or do they believe that we should be held to a higher standard, that our politics should be driven by ideas and high ideals, or, or silly undergraduate websites driven by foundations um, that hide behind a whole bunch of front companies, because that's what—that's the undergraduate nature that our politics is coming um, to. And I know the shadow treasurer is an honourable person, but yet he moves these second amendments because we have basically made it. This aberrant behaviour has been normalised. I ask those opposite to stand up against the crowd the online crowd that drives them to these stupid positions. Australians are not fools. Australians can see. Australians know, once the smoke clears, that we have had the best outcomes in both health and economic terms from this pandemic. They look and see around the world, and they know that while things have not been perfect, that others have suffered far greater than we have. They know all these things and they know that when they read online, when they read Twitter and they see the personal abuse, that it is only that is the path to destruction. So when those opposite move these second reading amendments so that some a bunch of undergraduate um, or people who may have graduated from university but their attitudes didn't can continue to assert that those on this side of the House believe in things that they have never said, never believed in, and have voted for things that were never available for them to vote on. Then I ask you, is that really what you want to do? Because if, you know, as Shylock said, as Shylock said, you know, I um, if if we be like you in all, then why not we be like you in this? And I will better the instruction. Because if you keep pushing our politics down this path, all you end up with at the end of the day is just both two sides being dragged down into a bottomless pit of personal abuse. Well, I'm not going to be dragged into that pit. I encourage those opposite who know better not to also be dragged down into that personal pit. I know that you're under pressure from the Greens. I know that you're under pressure from the far left in many of your seats. No, not you, Deputy Speaker. Yeah, that no. Not through the chair. Deputy Speaker, no one will put you under pressure, I know. Um, but I know all of this is happening. And I know and I know that there is that temptation there to play their silly games. I say to you, well the the member for Fenner raises the voices of McKellar. I wasn't going to. Thank you, Member for Fenner. I wish he'd done it five minutes ago. 
And I make that point. That these front groups just keep sprouting up with more and more names, hiding their, hiding their money, hiding their donations, hiding what they really believe in, refusing to answer questions. And I know that you face the same thing from the Greens. Let us come together to create a better politics, just as we created the world's best outcomes from the pandemic.